Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends. Uh, cordial welcome to His Excellency uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, President of South Africa. Good to see you, Mr. President. We know that uh, President uh, Ramaphosa also has been uh, the Vice President of South Africa. He's also the current chair of the African Union. And as we know, Africa has weathered the pandemic uh, a lot better than many other places in the world, at least uh, during uh, the first wave. We'll come back to that. Ramaphosa is also a very successful businessman, but started his career in ANC and was the chief negotiator when South Africa moved from apartheid uh, to democracy and worked very closely with also uh, late uh, President uh, Nelson Mandela and headed the committee uh, that really was also in charge of his release. So, um, President Ramaphosa, uh, great to see you. We know uh, you have a tough job. There's a lot of challenges, but also opportunities. So we're very pleased to have you here. And I, I leave the floor for you uh, to some uh, introductory remarks. And then I hope we can do a Q&A. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, President uh, Brenda, and distinguished participants and ladies and gentlemen. I must say that I wish to thank the World Economic Forum for the kind invitation to deliver these remarks on the state of, say, the world as we confront the devastation caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Today, humanity is facing an unprecedented global health, social, and economic crisis. The pandemic has triggered a global economic downturn of massive proportions, which has not been seen since, I would say, the Great Depression of the 1930s. The World Bank has reported that extreme poverty is expected to rise globally for the first time in over 20 years as the disruption caused by the pandemic exacerbates the effects of conflict, climate change, and also underdevelopment. As far as I'm concerned, it is clear that the world is at a crossroads. We're facing a common threat, and this means that we must therefore act together. While we must unite in defeating this disease, the challenges we must confront were not created by this virus. They were created by us in more ways than one. These challenges from poverty to the destruction of our environment, from conflict to inequality, from illiteracy to famine, are all the results of our own actions and too often our inaction. The virus has exacerbated these problems. It has also deepened these inequalities and set back our efforts to overcome them. Our task is therefore not to restore the world to where it was when the pandemic struck, but it is to forge a new path and a new design to a world that is just, peaceful, cohesive, resilient, and sustainable. It is only through multilateral action that the world can solve its challenges. It is our collective interest that the United Nations is strengthened as we work together to advance the global agenda for people, planet, as well as prosperity. The pandemic has underscored the vital importance of multilateral institutions working together in facilitating coordination, cooperation, and common responses to challenges. Beyond COVID-19, there is perhaps no area of human endeavor that requires common global action more than our response to climate change. It is essential that we each honor our commitments under the Paris Agreement to combat climate change with a specific focus on the means of implementation support and adaptation efforts. This is a key priority 
for our continent, Africa, as our continent is disproportionately affected by climate change, despite releasing the lowest carbon emissions in the world. Over the course of the last 10 months, the African continent has demonstrated its capacity for united action. And this is the one time when the African continent has acted all as one to confront a common challenge. As the current chair of the African Union, we had to refocus our priorities towards addressing the immediate challenges presented by the pandemic. The AU, that is the African Union, moved very quickly to develop a continent-wide COVID-19 response plan. And this plan includes technical assistance to national health systems, setting up regional collaborating hubs, and deploying community health care workers to support testing and treatment. One of the most significant innovations that I would like to talk about was the establishment of the Africa Medical Supplies Platform, a platform which has enabled all African member states to secure vital health supplies, such as diagnostics, as well as therapeutics, at really reduced prices. We also established a COVID-19 African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team to secure and find sources of funding for sufficient vaccines but also to secure the vaccines. And to date, the task team that I set up has secured a provisional 270 million doses for African countries directly through vaccine manufacturers. This is in addition to the 600 million doses that are expected from the COVAX uh, WHO-led initiative. Through its participation in these continental and global initiatives, South Africa itself continues to promote the need for universal, fair and equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. We are deeply concerned about the problem of vaccine nationalism, which unless addressed will endanger the recovery of all countries. Now, ending the pandemic worldwide will require greater collaboration on the rollout of vaccines, ensuring that no country is left behind in this effort. Here in South Africa, as in most countries, the pandemic has taken a heavy toll on our population. With the greatest burden of disease on the continent, South Africa has recorded around 1.4 million COVID cases and more than 40,000 people have lost their lives. The current economic downturn follows a decade of weak economic growth, which adds complexity and difficulty to South Africa's economic recovery path. Over the course of the nine months, with the support of social partners, the South African government has rolled out comprehensive set of measures to limit the economic impact of the pandemic. We massively expanded social protection to our people and uh, made sure that it is done on an unprecedented scale, providing temporary increase in monthly social grants to around 17 million of our people and implementing a monthly grant to those who were unemployed and they amount to about 6 million. And other relief measures include wage support that we have given uh, to those who uh, needed the wage support. And we also introduce a assistant package for companies and for working people. And through this scheme, we've been able, together with the banks, to ensure that companies uh, do have great assistance and we also defer the payment of certain taxes. Now, while these measures have proved vital in keeping many businesses afloat, also saving many jobs and keeping millions of South Africans above the poverty line, 
our attention has now shifted to rebuilding the economy and uh, working together with business and labor and uh, various other stakeholders, we've been able to craft an economic plan. And uh, this plan has a number of interventions that are aimed at repositioning our economy. And uh, through this, we are hoping that as we go through this pandemic, we will be able to have an economy that is sustainable going forward. Now, there are a number of things like growing manufacturing, increasing the level of investment. And over the last three years, we have mobilized about $51 billion in new investment commitments in our economy. And uh, we are hoping that that will ensue as we go on. Now, these interventions are also going to enhance and enable South Africa to better realize the one great potential, which is the Africa free trade area, uh, a fundamental sea change type of initiative to the African continent, which will enable the African continent, which has 1.2 billion people to operate as a single market over time. So we are hoping that as it has introduced on the 1st of January, that that is going to boost integration, increase trade and accelerate the buildup of productive capabilities and infrastructure in the African market. We will benefit from this as South Africa and we are pursuing each of these interventions with an urgency and resolve that matches the proportions of the challenge as well. However, we draw hope and encouragement for the way in which the people of South Africa have come together to confront this pandemic. In the last year, we have shown that it is collaboration, it is partnership and solidarity uh, that have been the most effective way in which we have approached this pandemic as South Africa. And now we are saying as we re restructure and transform our economy, South Africa will be open for business. As the entire continent is doing exactly the same, we will, through the Africa Free Trade Area Agreement, be able to say to the whole world, we are open for business. We are now moving forward with integration and we are going to be trading with each other and the world must participate with us as we search forward as a continent once again. I want to thank you for allowing me to share these thoughts with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and thank you for your leadership uh, throughout a very challenging time and also as Vice President, uh, securing uh, South Africa as a democracy, as a transparent economy, you have underlined the importance of the recovery plan. You're talking about uh, a new economy in your speech. How do you see uh, South Africa in the five to 10 coming years? Where are the reforms that will really increase the competitiveness of the economy. I know you're also uh, focusing a lot on energy, uh, that not everything is gonna go through ESCOM and et cetera. So I think a lot of the um, listeners would love to hear uh, your vision for making exactly. sure that uh, South Africa is a vibrant economy uh, in the future. Okay, so you couldn't hear my question. Okay, so I think we uh, have um, we have an audio uh, issue. No, you can hear me, Mr. President. Okay, thank you. So my 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 long speech uh, of a question uh, wasn't heard by the by by the the president. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, I I was thanking you really for your leadership, Mr. President, um, during uh, very challenging times. You also. Um, 
in your speech underlined the importance uh, of the new economy. Uh, and you start for South Africa and the competitiveness of your economy. You're also reforming the energy sector, not everything through ESCOM. So where do you see your country in five to 10 years if you succeed with your new economic plan? Well, we uh, issued uh, a recovery and reconstruction plan uh, just uh, towards the end of the year. And this was largely in response to the challenges of COVID-19. But of course, we were having other challenges prior to that. So we needed then to speed up the process, not only of economic recovery, but restructuring, restructuring focusing on reforms that we've got to embark on, reforms that have to do with a whole range of issues, starting with our energy challenges and finding new source of energy, but also allowing the private sector, as well as our local governments, to be the ones who can generate their own energy. Hitherto, the entire country has just really relied on a state-owned energy generation and transmission company, which is called ESCOM. And we've now agreed that we now must grasp the multi-energy source era and have various forms of energy, solar, hydro, wind, and uh, a number of other options that uh, we have available and that can also be generated by private sector entities. Now, this has been greatly welcomed, and we have now embarked on that journey. One of the areas where we've been a little bit slow, and quite slow, is releasing the spectrum to allow new innovations, fast data transmission, and a broadband. We've now embraced that. We are now in the process of doing uh, an auction of of the, of the spectrum. This has been done in a number of other countries. So we are doing that. We're also looking at network industries. Our ports have to be repositioned, our roads. And we've now also embarked on a massive infrastructure build uh, process uh, to build not only roads, our dams, and a whole number of other social infrastructure. So the economic recovery is then pivoted on all the reforms that uh, we believe we want to make. But in arriving at these reforms, we've worked together with the private sector. We've also worked together with the unions. We've also worked together with uh, social partners. So the issue of collaboration, the issue of co working cohesively has underpinned everything that we have done up to now. And uh, when we released the plan, it was welcomed by all, and now we're in the process of implementing it. It also touches on an important area which had been neglected in the past, visas for professionals and other skilled people who want to come and work in South Africa, entry visas. We're also focusing on the tourism sector. Uh, much as right now we are really engulfed in challenges of COVID-19, but we will get over this, and we're going to be restructuring a number of other sectors of our economy, agriculture, mining, you name it. Uh, we are manufacturing as well. So we are now in an era of true restructuring and true, true reform. And this is going to reposition the economy of South Africa. No, thank you for uh, sharing uh, that uh, vision and also the action plan. Uh, Mr. President, we know also with your background from business, you, you know uh, also what is important in that respect. I, I saw in the news that you were able to buy um, 20 uh, million uh, vaccines, I think it was from AstraZeneca, but you also in your introductionary remarks mentioned this uh, vaccine nationalism. So how do you see uh, the next months when it comes to dealing uh, with the pandemic in, in South Africa? And you also, of course, have still your hat on as the chair of African Union, and you have got a lot of positive, um, um, positive uh, re remarks on the way African Union has handled uh, the first wave and how you came together uh, in this. And Africa has been weathering it better than many other places in the world. Well, as I said in my remarks, <clears throat> we are concerned about vaccine nationalism. 
the rich countries of the world went out and acquired large doses of vaccines from the developers and manufacturers of these vaccines. And some countries have even gone beyond and acquired up to four times what their population needs. And that was aimed at hoarding these vaccines. And now this is being done to the exclusion of countries, of other countries in the world that most need this. And it was a great plaudible effort by the World Health Organization to set up the COVAX facility, where it felt that we needed to, to agglomerate all our acquisition processes so that there can be equity in the uh, distribution and in the access to vaccines. Now, rich countries in the world are holding on to these vaccines, and we are saying release the excess vaccines that you have, you have ordered and, and hoarded. There is just no need for a country which perhaps says, has about 40 million people goes and acquires 120 million uh, doses or even 160 million. And yet the world needs access to those vaccines. Now, we, in realizing how the world richest countries are, are behaving, we've set up the, uh, the vaccine um, uh, acquisition task team in Africa. And we've been marginally successful. But we need those who have hoarded the vaccines to release the vaccines so that other countries can, can have them, but also to have financial assistance. And in releasing the vaccines, we're not saying them just give them away. We are also saying, in addition to yes, doing that, we are saying, do make them available so that those countries that do not have access to vaccines right now should have access. And we want vaccines as quickly as other countries do that have already started, because uh, we are all not safe if some countries are vaccinating their people and other countries are not vaccinating. We all must act together in combating uh, coronavirus because it affects all of us equally. And therefore, our remedies, our actions to combat it must also be equal and they must be overarching for all of us and not be something that special countries or certain countries have uh, on their own to the exclusion of others. No, well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. I think we all uh, know that uh, COVID uh, anywhere is COVID everywhere. And uh, if you don't fight it all over the world, uh, it will also then potentially mutate and it will then hit also those countries that are already um, vaccinated. So this uh, vaccine na nationalism uh, is also biting yourself. I, I think that's very clear. So um, we know that uh, this um, free trade agreement in Africa uh, is a huge step forward. Uh, it's more than billion people. Uh, it is a huge potential also for more trade and investments um, in Africa, but also uh, to Africa. How significant do you think this uh, free trade agreement is? And uh, what are the next steps to make it into really a kind of uh, EU free trade, a single market of Africa? Well, the Africa free trade uh, Area agreement is, is one of those, I would call, <laughs> revolutionary uh, sea change initiatives that the African continent has embarked upon. And if I think about the formation of the African, uh, the OAU, which was formed many years ago by our forebears in 1963, this is possibly the most important initiative that the African continent has embarked upon. Our forebears, our founders, wanted Africa to act together, to be integrated, and it has taken us some time to arrive at that. And integration means much more when it affects the economic lives of the countries of the continent. We're a market of 1.2 billion people, and it's a growing market as seen by everyone around the world. It's a youthful market 
and it's a market of people who want to go forward and grow their economies and grow their countries. And this is a great advantage to us as the African continent. Now, most of the countries, the great majority of the countries have signed up to this uh, free trade area agreement and trading has now been switched on from the 1st of January. And now countries on the African continent are going to start, are going ahead with trading with each other rather than continuing to import goods that are made elsewhere in the world, African countries are going to be able to make their own goods and trade with each other. And we actually saw visions of the future with the African uh, medical supplies platform that we set up, because in a way that was like the precursor to the Africa Free Trade Area Agreement, because African countries were brought together on this platform and they started procuring medicines, uh, medical supplies together. But they also started going beyond that because producers and manufacturers in Africa started flighting their own products on this platform. And through that, African countries started trading with each other. South Africa, for instance, has already through this platform been able to trade up more than a few billion uh, rands based on the uh, existence of this platform. So when we now have the Africa free trade area, we are going to see greater trade, we're going to see greater participation and tariffs are going to be reduced or eliminated to a large extent. And uh, as the years go by, we will become a free tariff area and we will be a free trade area where we are going to be able to trade with one another. And the greatest joy is going to be in walking in a store in Johannesburg and finding goods, which we don't find now. Finding coffee from Kenya, we don't have that right now. Finding coffee from Ethiopia in our stores, teas from tea from Rwanda and so on. We just don't have those type of products right now. And this free trade area is going to open the door for trading for African producers and manufacturers. But the other advantage is going to be in boosting manufacturing, in boosting industrialization, because all of a sudden a market will have been opened and manufacturers, entrepreneurs, and industrialists will now know that we now have a market because when you have a market, you know that you can be innovative, you can be creative because you have a playground to be able to trade your goods and wares. So this is going to be the great uh, advantage and I applaud uh, African leaders for having grasped this needle, this nettle rather, and now we are moving forward uh, to begin the trading process in, on the African continent. No, thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you for your leadership and also thank you for your clear vision on the free trade uh, in Africa. Uh, this is uh, then Africa century uh, also. And uh, instead of beggar your neighbor, you should prosper your neighbor. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and all the best to you and your countrymen also uh, in this uh, struggle that we're all in uh, with the pandemic. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.